Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'd like to call this meeting of the Urbana City Council Committee of the Whole to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Council members Brown? Here. Hazen? Here. Hersey? Here. Jacobson? Miller? Here. Roberts? Here. Wu? Here. Mayor Marlin? Here. Okay. Eric, Eric um, is approaching. And here's all Eric. right, we, we'll just. Here comes Eric. We'll just wait for him for the next 10 seconds. <laughs> and while we're waiting, um, okay, so um, the first item is approval of the minutes of previous meetings from October 14th, 2019. I'll move approval of those minutes. <laughs> I'll move, move that approval. Okay, anybody to second? I'll second it with a correction. Okay. Oh. With the correction, moved yeah. by Jared, seconded by Dennis. Yes. And what is the correction, Dennis? Um, Discussion? I was actually present at the meeting, but they forgot for re some reason to list my name and the, those present. And it's proof because I actually approved the minutes of that meeting. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. so I actually participated in it, and it's recorded, but not listed. Uh, but I'm not listed up in the election so officials. Oh, All right. Thank you. And we w and Charlie will make that. Um, not that really that many people care, but, you know, <laughs> but just to make it legal, you know. Okay. We have a motion to approve the minutes with the correction that Dennis Roberts was, in fact, in, um, uh, in attendance of the meeting. Uh, can I, uh, all, in, all, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okie dokie. Next. Uh, additions to the agenda. Are there any additions to the agenda? <coughs> okay, no additions to the agenda. Presentations. Do we have any presentations tonight? And no, we do not have any presentations. Public input. And public input I do have um, from Esther Pat um, uh, regarding the downtown to campus plan, which is not on the agenda tonight. Uh, would you like to speak now, Ms. Pat? Okay. I'm Esther Pat. I live at 706 South Kohler, and I saw it was a short agenda, and this is about something that happened last week. So I thought I'd come tonight. First, I want to thank you for your thoughtful consideration of and vote on the uh, variance request last week. In the discussion, Mr. Roberts asked a question that led to a little back and forth that made me think I should come here and maybe inform or refresh the memories of council members about the campus to downtown plan. Uh, first, the plan was not written by the West Urbana Neighborhood Association. It was written by the city planning staff under then Mayor Jeff Markland uh, and at the direction of the city council in response to concerns that were raised by people living um, east of Lincoln Avenue. Uh, the fact that the plan was adopted by the city council 28 years ago does not make it obsolete or any less valid than it was then. Just like the Historic Preservation Ordinance, Human Rights Ordinance, the entire purpose of the plan was to preserve, and in this case to preserve for the long run, the balance of the neighborhood that existed at that time with predominant land uses being owner-occupied single-family homes, but a significant number of duplexes, uh, uh, rooming houses, and apartment buildings like the 92-year-old building in which I live. The reason for the plan and the downzoning was that the area from Lincoln to Ray Street was and will always be attractive to income property owners and developers because of its close proximity to the U of I. Uh, and so there was interest in protecting that single family character um, from excessive development. Uh, as you were told, Mayor Markland vetoed the plan because developers were against it. He was against it, his staff was against it, but the council overrode the veto. Ten years later, a property owner, Howard Wakeland, sued the city of Urbana, challenging the city's right to downzone. He wanted to build a 32-unit apartment building um, on Main Street, two doors down from Eric Jacobson's home, uh, at, at a spot that had had a single-family home that burned down in a fire. Uh, the city attorney wanted to settle and uh, let him build a 32-unit building but put a uh, pitched roof and a 
porch around it to make it look kind of like a house. Uh, the staff were against it, the neighbors were against it, and so the city attorney went ahead and took the case to the appellate court where the city of Urbana won. And although there was already precedent on this issue, there's now appellate court precedent in our appellate district that cities have the right to zone zone to single family for the purpose of protecting the, the single family nature of a neighborhood. I urge you to think about the fact that in every other context, your planning staff and you folks promote the idea that owner-occupied housing stabilizes neighborhoods. Whether you're talking about crime, community development, um, affordable housing, so everything's home ownership, home ownership. Well, the people who live in Western Bay, they care about home ownership too. And um, when the comprehensive plan review starts, I guarantee you there are going to be people coming to you asking you to change those boundaries that are zoned R2, to come south of High Street, or to go east of Busey, and maybe even to th throw the whole thing out. And I hope that you will stand by the intent and the purpose of the plan and protect the maintenance of a stable single family neighborhood east of Lincoln Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. We also have, um, are there any questions for Ms. Pat before she, any comments? Okay. Um, we have a um, input card here from uh, uh, Rep. Bishop King James Underwood and Reverend Dr. Evelyn Underwood regarding the Dr. Ellis subdivision sewer problem. They do not wish to address the members, but they are uh, still concerned regarding the Dr. Ellis subdivision sewer problem is still a concern of ours. Thank you. Um, uh, gentleman Steve Ross. Mr. Ross, did you care to, would you care to, okay. This is regarding snow removal, which is on the agenda and he is in opposition. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Steve Ross. Uh, I live at 609 West Green Street in Urbana. Um, and I'm here speaking on my own behalf, but I think I represent also the, uh, uh, some of the thoughts of uh, Dan Newman, who uh, I hope you've seen an email from Dan uh, regarding his opposition as well to the snow removal uh, expansion, I guess. Um, I'll say that I've lived there 20 years now, and I've always considered it my civic duty to uh, remove the snow from the, uh, from the sidewalk. And I am sure that I probably usually get it done in the 24 hours that, that this uh, ordinance is, is uh, requiring now, or would require. Uh, but I'm certain I don't do it all the time. You know, just things come up, work, your way, and uh, so I guess I'm here as a crotchety old man, sort of, uh, to complain about this. Um, I will, uh, I'll, I'll follow uh, Dan Newman's uh, outline that he used uh, in his, his note. The first point is pretty brief, safety. Um, we agree that a shoveled walk is much more safe than an unshoveled walk, especially one that's compacted and it's got ice on it. Uh, there's, no, there's no argument about uh, safety, a uh, shoveled walk is better. Um, the second item that Dan brought up was fairness, and I'll return to that in a, in a minute, uh, because that's where I think most of my uh, comments are. And the uh, third one is uh, the efficiency. Uh, I think Dan makes a good point that um, it's not very efficient to have, if you can imagine having every uh, different property owner up and down Green Street involved in trying to uh, um, clear their own walk or hire someone to do it and have those people come, just you know, a variety of people come and do it, very inefficient. It's not something that the, the city of Urbana does, for example. If we were be, uh, you know, the snow plows are, they go down all the roads and uh, uh, there's one source for it and we pay taxes for it and that's reasonable. And if, um, uh, if, if there would be a tax hike to pay for clearing the city, clearing our sidewalks, that seems a lot more reasonable to me than having everyone do their own or be responsible for hiring someone to clear their own sidewalk. Um, and then uh, Dan's second point, which is my final point, is the fairness of this. I find this very unfair. I'm not sure why Green Street and University were singled out. I don't believe there's any 
documentation that I'm aware of, any data that would say that, that those are the most heavily traveled pedestrian routes, I would say probably Illinois Street is a, is a contender for that title. Um, and uh, if, I was in, if I was dictator, I would <laughs> mandate um, clearing uh, sidewalks around the schools. I've walked my kids to Leal School for 19 years, and there's always a week or two or more of time when we just, we're just walking in the street because the sidewalks are, un you know, they're not cleared. So the real need, to my mind, is not green or university. It's around, uh, it's around the elementary schools and middle school and high school. So um, the other point I would make is that if this would become an ordinance for the city, it would be terribly unfair just to uh, burden those of us on Green Street and University with this, um, this requirement to get things cleaned up in 24 hours. Again, when, when the city clears streets, they clear all the streets. So if the city is going to require that uh, sidewalks be cleared, why not require all the sidewalks to be cleared? Then you, as property owners, would be under the same burden that I will be under to clean and within 24 hours or face a fine of, I think, $25 administrate, well, $25 fine, $55 administrative fee, I think the uh, website says, and then the cost of hiring someone to do it. So this isn't a trivial amount of money. Um, so let's see. I think that's uh, most of my points. That's the highlights, I guess. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ross. You're welcome. <laughs> Are there any comments regarding or any questions? Jack, uh, Eric? Yeah, do you have time to sure. uh, hang around for us to discuss it? Because we, our, our rules are that we can ask you questions, but we can't really discuss it with you until, yeah, we're okay. until the item's on the, on the floor. But we have a short agenda tonight, so okay. perhaps that would be good. Sure, I can do that. Thank you. Okay, and, and yeah, Dennis? Uh, yeah, if there's not any more comments from the public, I've got a um, comment or an announcement. Well, there's one more, let me, okay, good. and this is actually just an acknowledgement that uh, Dan Newman uh, sent an email to all of us, I think, uh, regarding the snow removal as well, and this is a printed version of that letter. So I think I'm done with public input. And um, go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like public input. Um, first, I'd like to um, uh, say what a great experience it was this weekend to participate in as an observer and a, and a dancer and a music appreciator to the uh, the 2019 Champaign Urbana Folk and Roots Festival held in our downtown. Um, numerous venues were open constantly and people were walking back and forth even if it rained it didn't seem to matter at all uh, a lot of participation from the community really excellent um, uh, musicians came and played uh, at all the different uh, time periods and slots in the schedule and it was exciting to see how many people uh, were c coming and going in the downtown area on Friday and Saturday night so and also during the daytime, I heard a really great performance at the public library here, the Urbana Free Library, mid-afternoon, other musicians uh, throughout the whole time. I really enjoyed um, dancing uh, to uh, the Klezmer music at the um, Urbana Dance Company upstairs. So I just want to mention that. I think it was a most successful event, and I'm really glad that the city participates by funding it through the Arts Commission and I think we should continue to do that in the future. And then the second thing I want to mention is that um, the Urbana Sister City program is sending a delegation in November to Thionville, our sister city in France, in the far northeast corner of France. Uh, we're going because we, uh, this is the second time that they have invited us in five years to visit with them as a delegation. And we're going to help them celebrate the 75th anniversary 
of their liberation of their town at the end of World War II, uh, and there'll be a series of commemorative events, uh, wreath flayings, parades, uh, speeches, and fun. So we're going to have uh, six people from the city are, uh, have chosen to, to uh, go on this trip. I'll be going myself. Uh, they're all paying their own way to do this. And uh, it is to establish and continue our friendship with a, another partnering city you know, around the world. And it's the goal of the Sister Cities program to build these kinds of international friendships to build understanding and cooperation among people. Thank you, Dennis. Okay, do, any staff reports tonight? No staff reports. Okie dokie. <coughs> so we have an ordinance on the agenda to consider. <coughs> ordinance number 20191060. An ordinance amending Urbana City Code Chapter 11, Section 1165, removing snow from sidewalks and other areas. And this is from Public Works in Carroll. I'll be introducing this piece. Okay. Um, as you may recall, um, in July, um, Bill Brown, on behalf of the of BPAC, brought uh, forward a recommendation to expand the um, areas that have mandatory sidewalk snow removal um, when it's uh, when the circumstances warrant and the and the um, ordinance is invoked by the um, director of public works and this item is um, merely bringing that that uh, proposal forward for council consideration I passed out a, a color map there had been a black and white map in your packets to show the expansion area and um, I will just say and, and and perhaps bill wants to to add to this that I think the um, impetus for the, and timing of this proposal is um, based on the infrastructure investments that will be made in University Avenue and in Green Street in the form of the IDOT um, rebuilding project on University Avenue and then the MCOR Phase 5 project on Green Street. And so um, the idea for you know, singling out these two corridors is related to the significant infrastructure investment and trying to make maximum use of that investment. So I don't know if Bill wants to add anything to that. Sure. Um, yeah, I think that was the main impetus for those two corridors. Uh, BPAC would love to have everybody in town clear their sidewalks or even do our safe routes to schools sidewalks. That was another thing we talked about. Um, I think the main reason we limited it to just these two corridors and the commercial areas in downtown um, and North Campus. North Campus obviously has a lot of foot traffic. Um, it's mostly for practicality. I mean, I think we determined there were four owner-occupied owner, owner homes on Green Street. Um, the people who own the multi-unit apartment buildings are already hiring somebody to clear their own sidewalks, and they typically will clear street sidewalks, but if not, they have somebody there. Um, they're required to, I think if there's more than four units, is that right, Esther? Um, multifamily properties are required to clear their own sidewalks, not the street, not the city sidewalks, but if they're, they have somebody there doing that, that, that was part of the rationale for, because um, we did look at Green Street pretty closely and University Avenue, and would have loved to include areas around schools, but if 50% of the property owners on Green Street show up tonight, imagine if 50% of the property owners all over town showed up. <laughs> so really it was kind of a practical issue, I think. Um, and um, you know, having one, one property not clear or one block not clear really kind of wrecks your whole walk if you're, if you're trying to get from one end of town to the other and, or from downtown to campus. So we included the whole corridor. Um, I don't know how many, I, I know it's 24 hours after an event is declared and it usually takes 24 hours after the snow stops and um, before the public works director, director even declares an event. So it's usually 48 hours. Um, I don't remember how many times there was actually a event declared this past year, but I do know that, <laughs> I do remember a couple of times where 
the snow had pretty much melted by the time <laughs> it was declared. So I think it's pretty rare. I don't know if you have, I have any some, figures. I have some data have some on that if you're that? interested. Um, so it, I, I have it broken down by calendar year just for ease. So which, we're not out of 2019, so it could still happen in 2019, but we've had two so far from last winter in 2019. We had six in 2018, five in 2017, three in 2016. Um, and to the point that you were trying to make about it, do it doesn't get declared until the snow stops and then um, people have 24 hours and the first thing that we do after we, after we give the 24 hour ela um, time elapse, then we go out and if there are any um, people who haven't complied, then they get a warning and then they have another 24 hours after the warning. And so you might be interested to know that in 2018 we issued 17 warning notices and only um, ended up doing six abatements. In 2017, we did issued 20 warning notices, only did four abatements. 2016, we issued 14 warning notices and did five abatements. So, you know, in, in some sense, it, it, it works because we say, okay, come on, we give the nudge and then we typically get the results. And then for those few that don't, we get compliance a different way. Yeah. And I did, um, when I presented this in July, I um, compared it to what Champaign currently has. Their area is, is twice as big as ours, basically. They're, it covers everything from campus to downtown. Um, so I don't think it's out of the ordinary. Yeah, I'd like to see it all over town, and I'm sure BPEC would too, but I think we tried to keep it to what was um, obtainable, attainable, obtainable in the short term. Bill, can I ask a question? So, um, with the proposed expansion on this, are these basically bike lane streets? Uh, this, no, mm -hmm. uh, no. Green Street, Street will be with MCOR. Mm -hmm. We didn't really consider bike lanes because that's the bike lanes on the street would be cleared by the plows anyway. Okay, so it's basically you're just talking about the sidewalks for people to to be able to. Um, walk down the sidewalks there they are um bus bus stop areas I and mean, there's a lot of bus stops on green okay. street and there will be more with mcor but yeah um you know uh springfield would be an obvious one except there's a whole block of springfield that only has sidewalk on one side and um maine is probably the next one that would be good but there's not as much bus traffic on maine i don't know if there's any bus traffic on maine yes there is i think there is, is. There? Okay. yeah i've been behind the buses <laughs> Jared. Did you, when you were collecting all those citations, do we know how many uh, commercial properties and residential properties lie within the districts currently? We probably didn't look that up. Uh, even when we prepared the list, um, well, w we, s we had sent out notices to each individual property owner who was going to be included in the new area, but I, had, I don't have any information at all about the existing area any kind of breakdown. How many are in the new area? <laughs> Commercial and residential? I, I don't have that at my fingertips, I'm sorry, but I can okay. get that for you. But presumably there's a lot. There were, a, yeah, there, there oh. are a lot of individual properties. I mean, we're properties. talking about hundreds of yeah, properties. Yeah, but a lot of them are individual properties owned by the university, for instance. Okay. But uh, I, I'm just going for scale of effect. T you know, you said we issued how many abatements Total over like the last three years that you just the gave the last three years figures? total abatements were fifteen. Okay, out of hundreds and of properties. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. and multiple events each year, so on and so yeah. forth. Okay, just can I just wanted to put that in my head if that's what that I was. I see. Okay, thanks, Sorry. Carol. Can it? Anybody else? Do you have a question, Mary Alice? Go ahead. Yeah, I do. Um, so I'm looking at um, the new areas that are shaded in pink here, and. On the east side, sorry, the west side, so between Lincoln and Wright Street, that item just north of Springfield, that's, I think all of the stuff on the east from Matthews over is University of Illinois property. Um, a lot of the properties from, I would say, Goodwin to North Lincoln and University are commercial. I can't think of a single, single family residence there but perhaps I'm wrong. So, so really, I think in terms of the single family residences, the ones that are most impacted are on West Green Street. 
And I personally know of three single family residents. I mean, I, I haven't walked down there and counted. Bill, you had said that there were four. Does that include properties that would not um, meet the four unit requirement that we currently have on the books? I think uh, when we checked, we looked at um, the, the properties that had uh, the code in the tax tables um, that indicated they were owner occupied. I, I think there were only four that showed up. I, I, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, of the properties that exist on Green Street, how many who were not affected would now be affected? So if we, if we require that four units, oh. so that's what I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how many parcels well, this Well, even impacts. with the four units, we don't require them to, to clear street, uh, street sidewalks. They only have to, have to clear the sidewalk from the street sidewalk to their front door and steps and things like that, anything on their property. I mean, my major concern is, is that property owners, they have people set up to shovel their sidewalks, to um, go ahead and right. do the driveways and so forth, but single family residences for the most part don't. And um, if they're on vacation for two weeks during the winter, which a lot of people go out of town, what are they supposed to do? Um, in addition, like, how do you find people who are going to shovel? I, I know I've tried to find people to shovel. I know other people have tried to find people to shovel, and you can't. You can't get people to come and shovel sidewalks, or it's very sporadic. So, A, I would like to know how many properties um, that aren't four units would be impacted, um, that are not commercial, and are not four units. So we can have an understanding of that. I'd also like to hear from uh, staff, or, or maybe even from Bill, why not one side of West Green? Why not just clear one side of it instead of both sides? And buses stop on both sides. That would be the main argument, I guess. Is if you're going to have a corridor, you might as well have it on both sides. I'm just wondering if we can impact fewer households, single-family residents. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could require it on the north side because the sun hits that a little bit more, but I wouldn't be in favor of that. I'd want to keep it to both sides. Um, and does the city have any recommendations on how property owners will have their sidewalks cleared? Do we have a list of people that people could look up online? And I mean, so no. we do not. So we don't have any it, it kind of resources. It doesn't mean that we couldn't attempt to, to develop such a list, but we don't have that now. Okay. Um, and my last question is, is there a way to get a rough estimate on how much it would cost the city to just clear from Ray Street to Lincoln, those two sides of Green Street? Um, I think, I mean, we could, we could make an attempt to estimate it. We'd have to bid it out. As I, as I think I mentioned, um, what we plan to do on the, on the compliance end of this is to have an on-call contract with um, someone yet to be identified to do the clearing rather than have staff do it. So um, we can probably get a sense once we bid that out of what it would cost to, to just contract all, all that work out. Okay. I would be interested in that. Okay. Thank you. Dennis. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I guess, what, can, we, can we be in discussion? Or we, need, we need to make a motion. Yeah, we need to make a motion and, to, and then we can discuss. All right. Okay. Jared? Uh, just judging from where this is going, I'll make a motion that uh, we send ordinance number 2019-10-060 and ordinance amending the Urbana City Code Chapter 11, Section 11-65 11 uh, regarding moving snow from sidewalks and other areas uh, to forward to the full council with no recommendation at this time. I'll second that. It has been moved by Jared and seconded by Mary Alice for this ordinance to be moved to the City Council without any recommendation with no recommendation okay thank you now discussion Dennis yeah um, I think I can understand the you know, the interest for uh, creating these new um, corridors of snow removal but as I understand it neither project on University or on Green Street will be achieved this fall and so it would seem to me that this ordinance is almost a year ahead of itself that it would be after the improvements are made that we would want to adopt this ordinance 
because those improvements haven't been done. The street reconfigurations haven't taken place. And I think that it would be interesting to find out, to have a study uh, and a comparison about pedestrian uh, use of these two corridors. I know that we're going to have a lot more significant use because of the new developments that have taken place at Lincoln, North Lincoln, and University. Um, the one on the north side of, of um, University Avenue is uh, open and people are already coming and going there. But the proposed development for the southeast corner hasn't even broken ground yet. Um, so um, I'm just wondering if uh, this probably is a good idea, but maybe it's one that we should adopt next year and just keep it on the books as far as like intent. Bill. Um, yeah, I mean, for the corridors, you, you can think about that. It's, that's a small part of what we included in the, in the recommendation. Um, I mean, you could, if we did it this year, you'd at, le we'd at least have a year to try out the, uh, you know, the new procedure of, of having a contractor. Um, I think it'd be a good trial period, um, maybe for those two corridors. If you want to hold off on issuing citations or something like that, we could do that. That could be administra administratively handled. For the other two areas, I mean, North Campus has been a busy area for a long time. Um, it's mostly, most of the corners are ADA ramps. It's, um, you know, our, our whole campus is very accessible, except in the wintertime when people don't shovel their, their sidewalks. So I think there's a good argument for that being well past due rather than ahead of, ahead of time. Uh, for North, or North, um, North Downtown to Crystal Lake Park, that's very timely because Crystal Lake Park, Park has just put in the whole 10 foot wide path along Park Street that connects the, the hospitals to uh, Five Points and downtown. Um, and the whole North Downtown area has been developing quite a bit the past few years with um, you know, the Broadway Food Hall and the, well, all of uh, the whole um, Gateway Shops area and everything along Broadway and the Boneyard and the 25 o'clock brewery, all that, you know, is, is pretty new, pretty done. So I think that's probably past due to. Um, I don't see any reason to try to delay this and try to um, spend a lot of money studying it, um, counting pedestrians, that it's gonna change anyway over the next few years. Um, I think we should just move forward with it. And I, I'm gonna vote against this proposal and, and if it, uh, because because I think it should have a recommendation for approval, but if it uh, so if it fails, I'll make another motion to uh, forward it with recommendation for approval. Can I say something? <coughs> okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the chair Thank and you. recognize Ms. Hersey. Thank you. So my question is basically, how um, how much of this falls on university property, and will they be held accountable for making sure that their sidewalks are indeed cleared um, and how will we in, uh, get them to clear it if they don't um, what's going to happen Carol to um, based on the the number of parcels I would say a, about a quarter of the parcels I don't know how that translates into street frontage mm -hmm. but um, in terms of the overall number of parcels maybe 25 percent are university and we treat them as we would any other property owner Oh, okay. If they don't clear it, we clear it for them and and then bill them. Okay. I just wanted to know that everybody is going to be, in fact, be, you know, if there's going, if if the way this is may af may affect uh, businesses and homeowners and everything. Um, I just I know that you know in my neighborhood how how um, long it took to get somebody to cut the grass on Goodwin. <laughs> and it's kind of like um, I think it was Bill that was saying by the time they get around to it you know the snow could be melted and then what do you do so well the objective for this is to get the snow cleared and if the Sun helps that's fine <laughs> okay so kind of go along with Dennis on this okay thank you Jacob and okay, now thank you. Mary Alice um, so my first question, I think I know the answer, but I just want to make sure. So there on North Vine Street right below uh, University, that's the viaduct. Um, and I'm curious who 
how that's going to be shoveled. I'm assuming that's the contract that you're talking about. I'm going to look because we were just passing around today all the locations where we clear sidewalks now in priority order. So um, I will I will get that and let you know it, we may we may be shoveling all that right now. So uh, two things: a, it would be um, great to know in terms of if we can have it colored in what number of sidewalks are going to be done by the U of I because they got quite the crew out there mm -hmm. um, in order to clear those sidewalks. Um, B, it would be good to know out of um, to shade in the areas in which the city will continue to be responsible for. And C, I would be supportive of um, pretty much what Dennis had said, which is to hold off on that, on those two corridors. And um, what Bill had mentioned is approving the area north of Springfield and north of Water. I, I would move forward with that personally. Okay, Dean. Wow, I guess I should dye my hair red or something. I'm sorry right. I didn't see you, sweetie. You sit back there. And you wouldn't see my hair. Y'all <laughs> <laughs> so laid back. I have a question for council. Is there any liability in civil liability in not shoveling your sidewalk? There's a point to my question. But. I haven't looked at the case law lately, but in the past, no. It's an act of God. Okay. Let me bear with me while I read one short paragraph from the um, ILCS. It's 745 ILCS 75-2. Any owner, leaser, occupant, or other person in charge of any residential property or any agent of or other person engaged by any such party who removes or attempts to remove snow or ice from sidewalks abutting the property shall not be liable for any personal injuries allegedly caused by the snow or ice condition of the sidewalk resulting from his or her acts or omissions unless the alleged misconduct was willful or wanton. So what that says to me is there's possibly liability in shoveling your sidewalk. No. Unless I, it's willful or wanton. So we, there's no. liability that people can claim that it was willful or wanton. It doesn't define willful or wanton. If, so. well. Will for a wanton, you know, for instance, throwing down water, letting it freeze. It doesn't define it. Well, maybe well, there's other. Right. I mean, it has to be on almost the order of intentional, unlawful conduct. Uh, Will fennel wanton. It you know, in order of decreasing difficulty in proof, would be intentional, the highest willful wanton gross negligence, and then just plain negligence. The reason that act came into existence because at one point case law did provide the opposite of what that act provides, i.e. if you shovel, it may create ice, and you could be liable for altering an act of God. That statute, I don't recall how old it is, but as I, as I recall, it's relatively old, and that is to counter the case law that creates liability. But they did come out, carve out, as you suggest, a provision for willful and wanton conduct. That means almost, if not in fact, intentional, willful, wanton, unlawful conduct. Okay. Well, I wasn't arguing that to either point. It was just uh, more informational so that we're aware of it. So thank you. Um, Jake, uh, Eric? Sure. Uh, now, I just, as I read the ordinance, my understanding of choosing Green Street uh, among one of the, was to one of the reasons was to encourage pedestrians to choose Green Street rather than to choose Illinois. Uh, that is, if there and, and to guarantee that there would be one clear path between campus and downtown, and because of the MCOR project. Uh, and because you know Green Street really is sort of the campus's main street, that uh, that Green Street was the logical uh, choice. Am I am I, um, am I paraphrasing, you know, your your thinking accurately, or the thinking of the uh, of of the commission? Well, I I think that's part of it. I think people more people would choose Green Street if it, if they knew it was clear. Um, I think MCOR was kind of the um, 
the main driving um, idea because presumably it will be used more um, because it's going to be more walk friendly and uh, I guess you know better bus bus facilities and everything. Um, it, a lot of people are probably using Illinois now because people are pretty good about shoveling there. Um, you know, I don't I don't know if it would de if it would make people go from Illinois to Green Street if if people continue to shovel on Illinois. But um, it, I mean, with the hotel um, potential hotel development um, and other downtown stuff happening, I think that was just an, another reason to consider it. They're just a, com a combination of things, I think. Yeah, go ahead. So I, I would be, I mean, this is not going to happen immediately, but I would be very receptive to the idea that the city would actually assume responsibility for clearing the sidewalks so that all the sidewalks would be clear to do for foot traffic what we do for vehicular traffic. Now, I understand that that costs money. And, and we are just uh, going into what we hope will be the last budget year of working through our structural deficit. Um, but when we, you know, are up for air, or if we feel we can justify a um, an actual additional uh, tax uh, to pay for this. I would very much like us to, uh, and and of course when when you are, you know, I mean you're you're doing uh, several jobs now, but when we have a permanent public works director, and uh, you know we're really stable that way, um, I would really urge uh, consideration of uh, you know the cost and the cost effectiveness of doing that. I, I like that concept. Before we came to Illinois, we lived in Shaker Heights, Ohio. Uh, and Shaker Heights gets a tremendous amount of lake effect snow from Lake Erie. And the city cleared the sidewalks. Now, you know, we paid for it, but it was a lot more dramatic. The effect of having the sidewalks cleared was a lot more dramatic than the increment on the tax bill. Uh, it, it, I think that's an idea that, that we should really seriously consider. Thank you, Eric. Anyone else? Okay, go ahead, Bill. Um, I think another reason we, we limited it to these corridors and these areas is just um, for, for compliance purposes. We, we thought this was obtain, obtainable, um, that people would mostly comply, that it wouldn't be uh, a really hard thing for these apartment buildings who are already shoveling their walks and their stairs to go out and shovel the city sidewalks. If if we were to require it citywide of property owners, it would be almost impossible to enforce. Um, in fact, I think Boulder requires it citywide, and I was checking today how much that actually helps, and most people in Boulder say people ignore it. It doesn't work. Um, so I think by, by narrowing it to these corridors, these areas, these high traffic areas, these high commercial areas, I think it's, um, it's, it's relatively easy to enforce. The university's already doing a huge job. Um, you could you get an idea of what it would cost if you see, see how much the university spent on their sidewalk clearing. But if you can imagine, there's twice as many sidewalks basically as there are streets for the most part. There's some areas that don't have sidewalks. The equipment um, would have to move a lot slower. You can't really go down a sidewalk at 20 miles per hour and throw s snow and hit the bumps and trees and everything. It would just be, I don't think you could even, you know, without 50 pieces of equipment and 50 people doing it all at once, I don't think you could even clear it in a day or two after a snow event. Just my, you know, just thinking about it, I don't think it would work. Um, you know, in other countries, people just go out and they do their sidewalks, they sweep their streets. Charlie just came back from Japan. He probably can has stories about how well people work together to get things done there. So I don't think this is a huge ask. And I, I lied. I am going to vote for this because now, now I'm worried that nothing would pass if I voted no. Okay, Jared. Uh, 
and then Carol. <laughs> Go ahead, Jerry. We've got uh, my, my motion, and I know it's not the one you wanted, Bill, but I think we've all asked for some additional information another week to consider uh, voting on it. Uh, I'd be open to pros and cons, uh, more, more to hear about from folks, but I'll, I'm not going to withdraw the motion. Motion, I'd, I'd stand by it. I think we should vote. Okay, so there's a motion on the table. Is there a second? For I already seconded. Already. Okay, it's already been second, <laughs> okay. even with the, um, with the no recommendation. Okay, and all in favor? All those in favor? Aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, so the ayes have it. And next we have ordinance number 20191061, an ordinance amending Urbana City Code Chapter 2, Section 2-27, Rules for Deliberations, um, uh, 2019, and that's been brought forward by the City Clerk, Charlie Smythe. Charlie. Yeah, this is just a further tweak to uh, our agenda and process. Um, there's a little fix in there. We didn't include the roll call and attendance, uh, or the, roll, uh, the call to order and attendance uh, earlier. Uh, and, and this gives council a little more flexibility, which was the intention of putting the word presentations in the agenda. And now without a motion, you can simply, the chair or the council can agree, you want to do a presentation first, you want to do public input first from a particular individual, and you'll just be free to just do what you need to do at that time. Do them both at the, right, at yes, the same time? Yeah. Okay, do I have a motion for carrying this council? Mary, Mary Alice. I move the ordinance number 2019-10061, an ordinance amending Urbana City Code Chapter 2, Section 2-27, Rules for Deliberation, be moved forward to City Council with a recommendation for approval. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Mary Alice has moved for it to go for approval, uh, moved for approval to the council, and Eric has seconded the motion. Uh, is, is there any discussion regarding this motion? Dennis. Yeah, so um, then how do we have a conversation or how do we decide if we uh, want to withhold the presentations till after public input? Mm. Uh, we just have like a straw vote before we Essentially, I think it's, it, you know, in my experience with presentations and public input is that we've had the, we've had a pretty obvious need either, you know, the, there's people here to hear the presentation and then they want to comment or there are some people available who are, who are present who want to speak to something that's not related and just simply want to get in and get out. And I think council has judged that and, and chosen the right uh, path uh, in the past by consensus. Yeah, I would say that um, for the most part, people who wanted to um, make public input, lot, like probably 85% of them don't want to actually stay for the event when it's actually discussed. They just want to express their input and then they go leave. They, leave, they go and they've said their say. And it's really tedious if you have two 20-minute presentations to wait for public input. To make those comments, you have to wait for some uh, some kind of, some presentation you have zero interest in, and you're sitting in the audience waiting to do your public input. So, I mean, I I thought that we were in pretty good shape when we had public input and then presentations. Very few people come to make comments on the presentations. They come to make comments on the known agenda, and a lot of times the presentations aren't really clarified. Sometimes they are, but they're not always. So, um, I guess this is kind of a fudge. I thought we were actually. Uh, some of this seems superfluous, but um, I thought we were actually in, had the order appropriate when we started with public input and then presentations. Any other comments, discussion regarding this motion? Uh, Bill? Yeah, I think I like the flexibility of being able to do it either way. Um, there have been times where we, we've had a presentation like from a lot of times when we've had a presentation from UBA or from the Visitor Bureau or something like that. Texas and there's also a hot topic on the agenda where you have 20 people wanting to do um, public input. So in cases like that where you have, you know you're going to have an hour of public input, I guess you could ask people from UBA or wherever to come back, but sometimes they're from out of town or out of state. Um, I think it makes sense for these short five, ten minute presentations to allow them to go before public input. So. Um, 
I, I appreciate having the flexibility, I guess. Okay. Jared? Uh, not that it's not under practice if somebody shows up after a public input period and we get a public input card that we don't allow them to speak. We always do. Uh, but is there any reason we couldn't officially list it both before and after so that the people who wanted to talk before could talk and leave and then the people who wanted to stay and hear the whole thing and then say their piece could comment after? I mean, I know we do it anyway on occasion, but thoughts on that, Charlie? Yeah, the form already indicates whether you want to speak, you know, during public input or at, at the time of a topic. Or before and, even. And I think, and, and uh, yeah, and before. So I think, I think it's, it's more allowing the chair or, or the council as a, as a whole to judge the situation. Uh, I think Bill, Bill accurately described what, I'm trying, what I was trying to achieve. I understand where Dennis is, is, is coming from. And, and yeah, that's the usual situation that you'll find yourself in. Just a few people who want to speak and not, are not here for the presentation. And I think you just want that flexibility. Um, hopefully this achieves that. But there are times when presentations should probably be done, um, especially if you've got an out-of-town paid consultant or something. Uh, and it's going to be five or ten minutes long. And this, this gives you that flexibility. Eric, would you take the chair for a minute? Um, thank you. I'll take the chair. And I believe Ms. Hersey would like to be recognized. Yes. Charlie, I, I guess my question is what is considered a uh, presentation as well. I know that one night with the IMC and we had the the 10 minute statement, you know, uh, 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 and then there were several people who had to c come up and and uh, make, you know, say their piece, like 37 people or something. <laughs> so I was just wondering, is it, is it considered a presentation if someone does a statement that takes more than t five minutes during the public input okay. the, the, the part? This, or? Well, this, this comes into the the, the the ability of council to modify rules as it sees fit. Okay. You know, so so technically, uh, the the presentations that are listed when they're listed on the agenda are invited. They've been or they're organized in some fashion, mm -hmm. and and we have a general idea that they're going to be five, ten, or even twenty minutes long, uh, depending on the on the topic. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are usually known in advance. Uh, something like. like that happened in this particular case, that was spontaneous. Mm -hmm. uh, there really wasn't any, uh, any And it was during a, a COW, uh, uh, COW yeah, meeting. And, and, and the situation it, was that uh, yeah. the chair could have stopped the presentation, at, or the, 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 the speech after five minutes. That's, mm -hmm. that's within the rules for public input. Uh, and it's up to council to extend the time past five minutes for for public, for each individual speaker of public input. Uh, likewise, we have a rule that that um, that limits. Uh, you know, when you have 20 or more people want to speak, then you 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 tell people they've got three, three minutes, minutes instead of five, mm -hmm. uh, so that the public business can be done. The state law simply requires that public input be allowed. Uh, that um, uh, and and uh, the council is allowed to to make rules around that. Uh, I. I trying to remember exactly how it, how it works, but um, I, I think, you know, we have a two-hour limit total uh, for public input so that you can get to city council business in an evening. Okay, thanks. So, but, but that's up to council to enforce mm -hmm. and to agree when to provide exceptions. And so your, your, um, your ordinance amending that is, you feel is just going to make it easier for us to it, it recognizes what I consider the practice that, uh, in my experience of 16 years on council. Just make it more fluid. We can decide right. what what is uh, right. all okay and what is when we need to pull the reins back. Yes. Okie dokie. Thank you, Eric. Um, I will now return the chair back to Ms. Hurst. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Marlin. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned this during announcements um, section. Tomorrow and Wednesday, um, I will be putting on my hat as the local liquor commissioner in with our city attorney and the deputy local liquor commissioner, and we'll be presenting the draft um, 
liquor code to current license owners, and actually it's open to the public, you know, it's open to anybody who wants to come. But tomorrow afternoon from 2 to 4, we'll be doing a presentation on the new liquor code, and then again on Wednesday morning from, um, I believe it's 9 to 11, and in the city council chambers, and we'll also be recording the session so it'll be available for people to watch at their leisure. But we'll be explaining um, the new code and new provisions and be available to answer questions. And following this, we'll be taking um, comments. We'll take all the comments we get, plus we'll be doing an internal staff review f between um, November and January and hope to roll out the uh, proposed ordinance in uh, February for your consideration. But tomorrow and Wednesday is the time we introduce it to the license holders. Okay, thank you. Um, Dennis? All right, so uh, but going back to the uh, how we conduct business here in the council. Um, probably, I guess it would be, I could see this as working at the discretion of the chair. The chair pretty much leads the, leads the meeting anyway and can order the um, agenda if necessary. And they also are the ones who receive the public input cards. And so if you have a stack of 20, you know that public input is going to be a very big part of the meeting. And then you have to just weigh whether it's more important to have the public to speak first, which are the local constituency of our community, or to have the individual representing some NGO or, you know, public official or something from to talk about a topic. So I guess it'll work. So I guess I'll probably support it. <laughs> okay. So we have, <laughs> thank you, Dennis. We have a, um, <laughs> and a uh, motion on the table and second um, uh, all in favor uh, so aye. 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 aye thank you and opposed all right the ayes have it now considering we don't have any new business any old business I, I see this meeting adjourned thank you very much <laughs>